Hello, my name is Dr. Roger Henderson. I'm a GP and I also co-host the GP Notebook study groups. Welcome to this GP Notebook podcast, where we discuss bite-sized topics aimed at all those working in primary care. Now, you can find us on all major podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. So do please follow us to receive notifications about new episodes. And if you like what you hear, do please consider leaving a review to help other listeners find us. You can also follow us on Twitter at GP Notebook for more information about new podcast episodes and study groups. And you can find me there too, at Roger the Doctor. Finally, you can visit gpnotebook.com for podcast episode show notes and to find out more about upcoming study group meetings. Now, in this episode, we'll be discussing benign prostatic hyperplasia, BPH. And I thought this would be a good podcast to cover because benign enlargement of the prostate gland is so common in men as to be almost normal, affecting about 9 in 10 men by the age of 90. Now, as a medical student, I was often told to call it benign prostatic hypertrophy, and indeed it still is. But this is technically inaccurate because hypertrophy defines enlargement without an increase in component numbers, such as, for example, increasing muscle fibre bulk in weight training. However, hyperplasia is actually a more accurate term, as this refers to an increase in the number of components that are typically seen in glandular enlargement. But for the purpose of this podcast, I think BPH is fine. Now, we all know that the prostate is a hormone-dependent gland. And so, for example, BPH doesn't occur in castrated males. And although BPH causes the typical lower urinary tract symptoms that we often see uh, being presented to us by men with BPH problems, other possible causes for these symptoms should always be considered. And I thought in this podcast I'd go through some of the the major things to remember and that I've learned over my years as a GP when um, discussing, diagnosing and treating patients with BPH. Now, as I say, it's tremendously common, but it can significantly impact individuals. Let's not forget that the prostate gland doubles in size about every five years between the ages of 30 and 50, which is obviously significant, but then after the age of 50, that growth gradually then slows down. So when we're looking with our patients, the impact of BPH shouldn't only be assessed in terms of their LUTs symptoms they may have, but also things like loss of normal daily functioning and reduced quality of life measures for both the patient and their partner. Now, one of the things I've been doing in recent years as part of my initial patient assessment when I'm considering a man with BPH is to measure their International Prostate Symptom Score, or IPSS. Now, obviously, this is in addition to the detailed medical history we would always take looking for things like voiding and storage symptoms in particular. And I'd remind us that voiding symptoms are things like hesitancy, weak stream, intermittency, straining, incomplete emptying and post-void dribbling. Storage symptoms, on the other hand, would include things like urinary frequency, urgency and nocturia. But the IPSS, the International Prostate Symptom Score, is a self-administered questionnaire that I find very helpful. It's got eight questions on it, seven score symptom severity and one scores on quality of life. So the eight questions, for example, one, over the past month, how often have you had the feeling of not completely emptying your bladder after you've finished urinating? Two, over the past month, how often have you had to urinate again less than two hours after you've finished urinating? Three, over the past month, how often have you found that you stopped and started again several times when you urinated? Four, over the past month, how often have you found it hard to hold your urine? Five, over the past month, how often have you had to have a weak urine stream? Six, over the past month, how often have you had to push or strain to begin urinating? 
and seven over the past month. How often have you had to get up to urinate during the night? Now, each of those seven symptom score questions are scored from zero to five, ranging from zero being never and five almost always. The eighth quality of life question is, if you were to spend the rest of your life with your urinary condition just the way it is now, how would you feel about that? This is rated from zero to six, with zero being delighted or happy and six being terrible. Now, although this single question may or may not capture the actual global impact of their BPH symptoms on quality of life, it can serve as a very valuable starting point for the doctor-patient conversation. So if we add all those scores up in the IPSS, a score of 0 to 7 is defined as mild, 8 to 19 is moderate symptoms, and 20 to 35 shows severe symptoms. And some studies have found that using a combination of the patient's age, the IPSS score, and the PSA reading allows us in primary care to diagnose BPH very accurately in about three quarters of men who report lower urinary tract symptoms. So we've taken a good detailed history, including the IPSS, hopefully, and then we go on to the physical examination as we normally would, obviously. And a digital rectal examination, a DRE, should always be done in order to assess anal sphincter tone, as well as helping to ex estimate the size of the prostate and obviously checking for things like abnormal prostate nodules, the possibility of prostate malignancy or rectal masses. So don't forget to palpate the bladder at the same time and inspect the external meatus in the man. Now, we all know the prostate gland should feel smooth and firm, not hard, just firm, with a clearly defined median sulcus. What we don't want to feel is a hard nodular gland with no palpable sulcus, because that obviously suggests malignancy. So you've taken a good history, you've done a good detailed examination, including the DRE, Let's go on to the routine investigations that I would suggest are necessary in BPH. So in the initial assessment, a dipstick urinalysis and an MSU, I think, are both important. And obviously, we're checking for things like glycosuria, proteinuria, hematuria, and infection there. And routine blood tests, as I would always do, I would include a full blood count, UNE, liver function tests, and creatine, as well as the PSA. Now, it must be remembered with PSA that normal PSA levels do alter with age. Now, although there's some debate about whether testing for this in men over the age of 70 or in men where there's a less to 10 to 5 year life expectancy um, expected, both the American Urological Association and the European Association of Urology Guidelines do suggest that serum PSA can be helpful in assessing treatment options, primarily as a rough indicator or as a surrogate for prostate size. And I think most of us would be doing a PSA anyway. Interestingly, although a combination of a DRE and a PSA may be the best initial way to distinguish between benign prostate conditions and malignant ones, studies do suggest actually that the evidence for this approach is poor but I think most of us would be doing it anyway. And an in important point here, I think, is that a gentle, and I stress gentle, digital rectal examination is unlikely to raise the PSA test result. Now, obviously, referral to urology should not be delayed if appropriate or if you feel that a two-week rule should be triggered. And in 2020 and 2021, NICE did provide us with updated guidance on suspected cancer recognition and referral, and it recommends referral for a number of situations, including acute urinary retention and acute kidney injury. They suggest that that should be an immediate admission. Visible hematuria should be seen in two weeks' time. Prostate cancer malignancy suspicion should obviously be seen in two weeks' time. And culture-negative dysuria 
should also be seen in two weeks, as should chronic urinary retention with overflow or nighttime incontinence. Other referrals should include recurrent UTIs, microscopic hematuria, and failure to respond to treatment in primary care with poor quality of life as assessed by an IPSS score. We typically find that other investigations in PPH are done in secondary care, things like use assessment of urinary flow rate and imaging, which may also be necessary if there's any suggestion of urinary tract obstruction. An ultrasound examination of the prostate may also assist in the choice of medical therapy for a patient. Now, both PSA and DRE are unreliable in estimating prostate size as such, and so imaging is usually recommended, particularly before any surgical intervention. So what about treatments? Well, this can be a thorny issue, but in patients with minimal symptoms, by which I'm thinking about an IPSS score under 7, then I've found that watchful waiting is actually quite a good treatment option here, provided, and this is an important caveat, prostate cancer has been definitively excluded as a diagnosis. And treatment options for patients with bothersome moderate IPSS score symptoms and severe IPSS scored symptoms can include watchful waiting and lifestyle modification, but in moderate to severe cases, medical, minimally invasive or surgical therapies are usually the norm. But lifestyle changes are important, and especially in patients with mild symptoms that don't bother them unduly, these can be life-changing. So I'm just going to go through a few of these to mention to your patients. And I always suggest fluid restriction is really important, particularly in the evenings and prior to bedtime. And this includes avoidance of caffeinated beverages, alcohol, and even spicy foods. Check for some drugs such as diuretics, decongestants, antihistamines, and antidepressants, which may be making symptoms worse. And consider bladder retraining, by which I mean using timed or organised voiding over weeks and months. Avoiding constipation is obviously important and treating if need be. And weight loss in people who are significantly overweight or obese is important too, as well as the prevention or treatment of conditions associated with metabolic syndrome. Now, pelvic floor physical therapy in cases of suspected pelvic floor dysfunction can be helpful. Things like Kegel exercises and urge suppression exercises. But regardless of any treatment pathway taken, we should always be periodically assessing our patients to assess their progress because of the natural tendency for symptoms of BPH to progressively worsen over time. Now, there's a wide range of medical treatments available, as we all know, if need be, and I'm not going to go through these in any great detail, but for most patients, an alpha blocker is usually started as initial therapy. Or you can start a PDE5 inhibitor in patients who also have erectile dysfunctions. Tamsulosin is probably the most selective drug in targeting alpha-1 receptors in the prostate gland, bladder, neck and urethra. But longer-acting alpha-1 blockers include terazosin and doxazosin. Alpha blockers do work quickly. They're usually well tolerated, but there can be an increased risk of falling and fracture in men taking these, as well as an increased risk of hypotension and head trauma. Now, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and I'm thinking of things like dutasteride or finasteride here, can be used as initial monotherapy in patients with large prostates, and they are effective in reducing prostate size and the need for invasive surgery. However, they have a much slower action of onset um, than alpha blockers and they need to be continued if tolerated for many years. They can also be added to alpha blocker therapies in patients with large prostates and symptom progression. PDE5 inhibitors obviously may improve erectile function and lower urinary and LUTs but Tadalafil is the only approved PDE5 inhibitor at the moment for patients with comorbid BPH 
and erectile dysfunction. In men with moderate to severe LUTs and bladder storage symptoms, then anticholinergic therapies such as oxybutynin or solifenacin can be used, but do remember the potential side effects with these. If medical treatment has failed, or men have a large prostate gland causing their symptoms, then surgical treatment options are then usually considered. And I would refer any of my patients to urologists for surgery if they have BPH complications, such as uh, renal insufficiency, recurrent hematuria or retention, or they've got refractory responses to medication, or they don't wish to take medication, or they have unacceptable side effects. Now, there is a wide range of possible surgical options now available compared to some years ago. And again, I'm not going to go through these in any great detail, but they do include TURP, transurethral resection of the prostate, which is still the standard surgical procedure for men with prostate sizes less than 80 grams and bothersome BPH symptoms. And has also still been the historical standard against which all other surgical approaches are compared. And you usually typically achieve a good improvement in LUTs. However, they do have an increased risk of bleeding compared to more modern procedures. Simple prostatectomy can be done, sometimes robotic assisted, and transurethral vaporization of the prostate, or TUVP, uses the same type of electrodiathermy device as for a TURP, but can be used at lower temperatures, and this can lead to reduced blood loss in contrast to TURP. Some of my patients have had very good results with the prostatic Eurolift system, especially in men who want to preserve their erectile and ejaculatory function. You may well know about this, but essentially there's an implantable spring-loaded T-shaped device that's delivered through a cystoscope, and once in place, it opens up the prostatic urethra by compressing the prostate parenchyma. And compared to a TURP, certainly sexual function is more likely to be preserved. Holmium laser enucleation of the prostate, or HOLEP, is equally effective, but the moment is slightly more expensive as a procedure than Urolift. Quite recently, water vapor thermal therapy, Rasium, has been approved by NICE for treating LUTs secondary to BPH, and this uses water vapor to destroy excess prostate tissue. It's carried out as a day case, and it's cheaper compared to TURP. And finally, transurethral incision of the prostate, or TUIP, can be offered to patients with a small prostate, by which I mean smaller than 30 grams, who are unwilling to have more invasive surgery or more unfit to have it. And this is associated with lower rates of retrograde ejaculation and the need for blood transfusion compared to TURP, but unfortunately does appear to have a higher symptom recurrence rate. So that was a general overview of BPH, and I do hope you found that simple podcast helpful. Do have a look at the show notes that accompany this episode at gpnotebook.com, and we'd be very grateful if you'd consider following the podcast and leaving us a review on your favourite podcast platform. Feel free to get in touch via social media at GP Notebook or email support at gpnotebook.com if you have any questions, comments or ideas for future podcasts. You should also visit us at gpnotebook.com to register for our virtual GP Notebook study groups, which occur throughout the year, and to download free shortcuts to help improve the lives of our patients in primary care. But as always, thanks for listening, and until the next time, goodbye. Goodbye.